a warm welcome to this special program coming to you from the ancient seat of learning that's Nalanda International University. Government of India is in the process of reviving the ancient Buddhist monastery at the same time reviving the grandeur and romance of a period dating back from the 5th to the 12th century. What is this Nalanda model of learning? What makes it really special? And can this model of learning be replicated across the country? To discuss this and much more, I'm joined by the celebrated faculty members of the Nalanda International University. Let me tell you, they are not only academicians, but legends in their own capacity. Now, let me introduce you to them. Next to me is Professor Gopa Sabarwal, who is the Vice Chancellor of the University. Next to her seated is Professor Aditya Malik. Next to him is Professor Pankaj Mohan. Next to him is Professor Samuel Wright. Next to him, again, is Somnath Bandupadhyay, Professor Somnath Bandupadhyay. Next to him seated is Professor Pushpak Kumar Lakshmanan and at the extreme right, at the extreme right, the left, I'm sorry, I'm joined by Professor Kashyap Ghani. I welcome all of you on this special program on Raja Sabha TV and not to mention here, I'm also joined by the student community of Nalanda University. Now let me kickstart this entire debate with uh, Professor Gopa Sabarwal. The big question at the moment is that when there are about 687 universities in the country, what is the need of another Nalanda? Well, one short answer to that would be none of the 687 universities is Nalanda University. Okay. And there was clearly a need for a university that would uh, carry forward the legacy of old Nalanda, draw inspiration from it. And uh, what new Nalanda is aiming to do is draw from the best uh, traditions of old Nalanda. Okay. It is also an inter-Asian university, a university that focuses on re-establishing the links that India had with Asia in, uh, in a different era okay. and to try and replicate that. Okay. And, to, and it is a research university. It's, okay. it's, it's different from just a mass teaching university. This is a research university and in an educational landscape where a large part of our higher education institutions have to devote themselves also to educating everybody. Uh, there is also space for uh, the high-end research university and Nalanda is designed to be that. Okay, so if I were to ask you, uh, uh, Professor, what would be that one USP in maybe two lines you would say about Nalanda? What is Nalanda all about? All about? <coughs> well, I think it's an extraordinarily inspiring um, uh, enterprise, if you like, an insta inspiring project that inspired me to come here and leave a permanent position with many kinds of you know facilities that I had overseas okay and uh, to contribute to the growth of um, open liberal uh, independent and critical thinking and ways in which uh, we train students to respond to the many complexities of right. today's world but so what, uh, what, what really mesmerizes me that when you talk about an international university with a liberal mindset, liberal arts and uh, setting up the regional cooperation as, as its main plank, the biggest question is that why of all the places Rajgir, uh, you know, a, a backward place, why would the international faculty really get attracted towards, uh, towards a place like this? If, if I could uh, ask you, Professor, you from which place? Uh, well, I'm from Chicago. I did my degree in Chicago, okay, okay. In the U.S. Uh, so, I so what, what really attracted you to this university? Well, I think there's a couple of major, major reasons. One is that there's a strong focus on research, uh, okay. not just uh, cultivating research from the faculty side, but working with students closely to cultivate an uh, environment of research activity, research programs. And also, uh, being in Rajgir, I think, also provides us uh, unique access to the region's archives, for example. So okay. carrying out uh, archival so research the, the or the biggest, research. the biggest advantage probably would be its proximity to the ancient side of, the, of Nalanda. But, uh, so if I could ask you, uh, what is the real benefit here? Or, or, or rather, I would put it in the other words, what, would be, what is the real pursuit? Is it, of course, when, 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 an, when the faculty comes to a campus, you need infrastructure, you need coffee shops, you need linkages with, with, the, with the other faculty members. What really are you not finding it here? No, I think uh, the most important thing is uh, academic pursuit, uh, which comes okay. from a, 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 which comes from within, and there has to be a stimulating environment, okay. uh, not just uh, amongst the faculty and the students, but also amongst the local environment. Okay. So if you just uh, turn around and see the local ambience and the environment, 
uh, you would feel and understand that there is a deep connect uh, both in terms of space and time okay. that really inspires you to uh, do something uh, different. It's very different. Yes. Okay. I'll, I'll, in fact, I'll come to the other uh, faculty members later. Let me ask a few questions to the students here. Uh, if I could come to you, ma'am. Uh, what has really attracted you as a student? Why not other universities? Why of all the places only Nalanda? I, I was a chemistry student before and uh, the course of this particular curriculum is very different. Okay. It's, it's environmental studies, it's not science. Okay. So it deals with every aspect of environment including the social aspect, the environment at its core object. Okay. So uh, basically it's about the curriculum and it's obviously this nature and the geological time scale in which Nalanda is placed. Okay. What according to you really attracted you to Nalanda? For me basically I'm the student of history here. Okay. So for me, basically, just being in proximity <coughs> with the actual Nalanda site, mm -hmm. you know, you're learning from the same university okay. while being connected to the ancient site. Okay. There's a sort of connect that you feel while you're here to the ancient site. Okay. So that was one of the main reasons why I decided to come to Nalanda okay. University. Now, let me tell you the viewers that uh, this campus really is special. There are talks about making this campus uh, net free, ca net zero campus, net free energy campus. So those are the kind of uh, discussions which are taking place. Uh, what is this really net zero ca campus concept? What is this all about? I think when we sat down to uh, begin, uh, you know, thinking about uh, the construction process of New Nalanda, okay, uh, we realized we weren't just building any university. Okay, when you are building a university afresh in the 21st century, uh, you need to build it keeping in mind what is the best that technology can do right now. Right. And but for you the task was much uphill because you had to write, start from the scratch because you had to rebuild the whole Nalanda, the ancient uh, structure? Well, no. So what we, what we were inspired to do was we looked at all the environmental standards that now exist. It's okay. either LEED or it's Griha in India. Uh, and then we decided to push ourselves further beyond Griha. Okay. So we, uh, the net zero idea is your net zero energy, net zero water, net zero waste. Okay. And we are trying to build a campus that is self-sufficient in many ways. Okay. So we will try and generate as much of our electricity as we can on, on site, uh, try to be off-grid, uh, try not to uh, tap the groundwater. Okay. Uh, we are trying to uh, you know, catch all the rainwater that we get and right. only use that right. so that at no point can our neighbors in the area say that the university is depleting the groundwater sources? So a lot and, of and I'm sure that no university in India at the moment is providing this kind of a self-sufficiency you're talking about. I think we are the first ground-up net zero campus that is being attempted anywhere, okay. actually globally. So okay. it's okay. quite a, a big okay. challenge. Yeah. Let, me, let me ask a few students, when Ma'am's talking about a net zero campus, what kind of a learning experience is it for really for the students? Uh, since we are from the ecology and environmental studies right. and uh, we are dealing with the societal aspect of the studies right. we are dealing with the technology aspects and okay. uh, this is where in the technological part comes in okay I implementing all the latest technologies to use to harvest the okay. renewable resources and make okay. it self-sufficient in a way so that we don't uh, in the ancient uh, uh, university and uh, much of it has been, I think, is be still being passed on here uh, in this uh, new rebuilding of uh, the Nalanda University. If I could come to you, uh, how are you trying to revive the ancient university at the moment in terms of teaching, in terms of interactions? For example, you know, you and Sang had also written that there was a lot of stress on debates and discussions, discussions at that point of time, as I was saying. Uh, does it happen on a daily basis or you have, what, what is the method you're adopting for it? Uh, it's, it's basically built into the classroom process which we adopt. In okay. Nalanda, uh, what we try to do, it is not uh, teaching which is limited to the classroom. In Nalanda, the entire site where we are situated is the classroom for the students. Okay. So it is a combination of classroom teaching, interactions, field visits, site visits so our, our students regularly go out to visit sites and start study there and come back to the class have discussions and deliberations so the idea of a classroom is not conventional in okay. Na okay. Nalanda okay. also I would just add one more thing K keeping in touch with the spirit which Huen Sang noticed in old, old Nalanda we also stress on some very uh, 
significant and resourceful interactions with other right. international in institutions of higher learning. Right, right. Let me, let me come to a few students here and talk to them about the outreach program which uh, the faculty members have been talking about. You've got clusters uh, in outreach villages where you go down and you interact and you, you have a hands-on experience to what all you're learning in the classroom. What is the experience like for you? What, you're from which stream? I'm for, I belong to the School of Ecology and Environment Studies. Okay. Uh, so for us, um, outreach or constructive programs uh, means a lot because okay. at the end of the day, you're making a difference in the lives of the people around you. Okay. And it's an inclusive kind of growth and development you're foreseeing okay. um, that you want to grow along with the people around you and the society along with you in a sustainable okay. manner. Okay. There's a lot of emphasis today uh, on sustainability, and this is what we f primarily focus on. A very significant point you made, emphasis on sustainability. If I could ask you, uh, from which stream are you? I'm also from the ecology and environmental ecology. studies. What, yeah. what is the experience like for you when you go out to the outreach villages and interact with the people on the field visits? The people are very curious. In fact, they are very supportive when we go out to this area. You see, it's very much unexplored by the researchers. So they become very keen when we go and interact with them. They are very keen to answer to our questions, to our queries, okay. very cooperative. Okay, okay. Uh, now the biggest question is that the way the other universities are functioning, uh, they are market driven, they talk about economy. What really is this campus talking about? And when the students pass out from this campus, what are they really looking at? I'll come to Vice Chancellor Gopa Sabarwal on this. Uh, what, I mean, how are you really training the students? Once a student passes out from Nalanda University, what is the ultimate aim? Well, the ultimate aim, we, I mean, we would like our students to chase their dreams and uh, do whatever it is that interests them. I think. Uh, what an Alanda scholar will have is they will be very well trained. Uh, the certification will mean something. Okay. And uh, when you talk about certification of Nalanda, what does it what does it really signify? I mean, as an institution, I think we are uh, you know we are very focused on developing each student. It's okay. not about education at a level where uh, we're not. Uh, focus on learning outcomes. So clearly, I think, as with any good institution, if somebody has is uh, coming out with an Alanda degree, uh, you can be rest assured they're very well trained in lateral thinking and in depth thinking. They have great analytical skills, okay. and they are ready to do pretty much anything that they feel like in the world. But of course, being a research university, at you know a few years down the line, I think some of them will also make very good uh, academics themselves. Okay. It's, it's almost a year since uh, the classes started. Last year they began. And it's almost a year when you've been taking these uh, classes in two schools, I believe, uh, historical sciences and ecology and environment. Uh, how has the experience been in the last one year? Do you think that the process or the direction in which the Nalanda University has started, are the steps taken in the right direction? Well, the short answer would be, of course, yes. We're, we're, uh, every day we're working towards uh, the vision that uh, we have set out for ourselves and that, that the university has been founded upon. Uh, we're uh, working on building a library, for example, okay. uh, generating unique resources of the library, for example, for, for advanced research. Uh, and in terms of uh, developing a strong uh, curriculum, as Dr. Ghani was talking about. Uh, so there's a whole sort of um, uh, range of activities we're working okay. on. Yeah. When uh, the ancient uh, site of Nalanda was being built, it said uh, in the history books it's written that it took about 200 years to build that entire uh, ancient seat of learning. This rebuilding process now it has started since a year. How much time do you really think, Professor, that it would take to complete the rebuilding process of this uh, uh, university? I I'll hold the mic. Sir. Now, hold. reconstruction is an ongoing process, okay. and I'm not a, an astrologer, so I can't tell you okay. how long will it take. But but roughly, yeah. roughly, it's uh, one decade or two decades or three decades. But we are, you see, in the right direction because what we are doing here is quite different from the other universities in India. Okay. You see, uh, Nalanda University was noted for pan-Asian resonance. You okay. see, in, it was a thread which connected India with the outside world. And our curriculum reflects the resonance of Indian history in other parts of Asia. Okay. So something new that we are creating is of course of very important, uh, is of uh, significant uh, value for the country. Okay. And uh, now when the new campus is built in four or five years time, okay. and the infrastructure 
is established, then naturally the progress of Nalanda University will be accelerated. Okay. You see? But, but the biggest challenge, uh, Professor Gopasabharwal, I'll come to you, biggest challenge in rebuilding a university and that too in a place like Rajgir, uh, what has been the biggest challenge for you? Is it the funds or is it putting the systems in place or what is it really? Uh, no, on the, uh, I think from day one, I mean, when I got involved in the project and, you know, I heard from the Nalanda Mentor Group, which is now our governing board, what the vision of the project was. Right. I think there was never any doubt in my mind about the location being a disadvantage. I think we are very clear that being located in Rajgir. But what were your apprehensions when you actually stepped on the, on, the, on the lands of Rajgir for the first time. What was your honest apprehension, if you could share with us? Well, I mean, you know, I must be, f I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a sociologist. I go to field work, so okay. I'm used to being in various parts of the country. So I don't think I had uh, too many apprehensions at all. Okay. Uh, Bihar has been a great place for, for me, even as a single woman, to come in in the last five years, uh, travel freely, uh, never felt threatened at all. Uh, it's a very safe place for women in that sense. Uh, I think what we began to do as we set out to uh, establish the university in its first schools was use our location to our advantage. Okay. Uh, if that I may use the word like field school, as, one of, <coughs> as, as Sam was saying, right. uh, the idea that our students can go out and uh, you're not studying ecology and environment in the classroom, right. there's real farming communities outside our front door who are doing really innovative agriculture. We want our students to go and experience that. Right. All of Rajgir and Nalanda is a very rich archaeological uh, site. Uh, we want our students to actively engage with that. So I think in terms of location, it's been a very big advantage. And we are doing everything in terms of establishing a curriculum that picks on that advantage. Uh, I think not being in a metropolitan city is actually a very good thing for a university. Okay. Uh, so so you, would, you would look at uh, setting up a town like Cambridge or Oxford. Are you aiming something on, on those lines? I think, uh, you know, we can see Rajgir changing before our eyes. I think it's a matter of time that uh, Rajgir will become a university town. Okay. Uh, we can see that happen and I, it would be good if it, it happens. You know, we get more students in, uh, facilities in Rajgir will grow. Uh, so I think that will happen. You started with how many students and what is the current strength of the students at the moment? Well, last year was a very small, you know, pioneering batch. We had 15 okay. people. Okay. Uh, we've gone up to 50 in the current batch. 50, which is not, which is really not bad. Let me ask a few students here when you all joined the first batch uh, when we were still into the course what were your apprehensions I'm from Japan yeah. and uh, I'm in the school of yeah, historical yeah. studies yeah. thank you ma'am uh, and I'm really interested in the archaeology in okay. India and uh, I feel a big opportunity here to uh, examine many uh, archaeological sites mm -hmm. in India and uh, but you had any apprehensions in your mind when you joined because it's a new experiment which, which, which the Indian government started? Yes, so uh, it's a... It might work, it might not work. Those are the kind of apprehensions which students always have. Uh, so far I uh, haven't uh, experienced any... No such apprehension. Or you wouldn't want to talk about it. <laughs> uh, I was a bit of a skeptical about okay. the uh, scenario, but uh, after coming here, it's a different thing. It, it has given me a lot of new things. So it's totally a different experience for okay, me. Okay, okay. It's a positive experience. Okay, it's a positive experience. So for students, by and large, the experience has been wonderful. But uh, you know, there is another perception that uh, uh, the ancient, uh, uh, the, the ancient Nalanda University uh, stressed too much on Buddhism. But the new university, the stress is not too much on uh, Buddhism. There are various uh, people, you know, who are talking about the fact that the stress is not too much on uh, uh, on, on on Buddhism, and you know, the, the the faculty members or the university is just trying to use Buddhism, you know, for the game, uh, for the for the sake of getting funds. So, it, how far is it true, really? Now, Nalanda University was a monastery primarily, okay. right? So it's natural that the emphasis was on Buddhism, and Buddhism was the most important. Now, discourse, intellectual discourse in the pre-modern times. Right. But new Nalanda has a new vision because it has to respond to the new realities of the times and new imperatives, new challenges. So we understand Buddhism from different perspectives. You see, because in historical studies also there are different uh, courses which deal with Buddhism. For okay. example, my own research is on the relationship between the state, society and Buddhism in East Asia. Okay. Then there is another professor, he teaches Buddhism in contemporary Asia, you see, in the 20th century Asia. Okay. So even though 
we don't have yet a school of Buddhist studies. We recognize the importance okay. of Buddhism and also we realize that Buddhism has to be reinterpreted and, and understood okay. from the modern. One last question before uh, we wind up the program. Uh, I'll come to you, uh, Gopa Savarwal. Uh, basically, uh, there are various, uh, you, the governing council, which, which, which is comprised of uh, the, the, the faculty members comprising from various countries. Uh, any kind of pressure you feel, you know, uh, because uh, you have to deal with the diplomatic relations when there are so many countries involved. You have diplomatic relations in mind. You have sectarian pressures. Uh, I'm not going into the details of any kind, but, but does that really work? No, I think uh, our governing board, uh, which was earlier the Nalanda Mentor Group, have okay. actually been the people who have been associated with the project for the longest time. They've right. been doing this since 2007. Okay. It is their vision that we are uh, trying to bring to reality. Uh, the board is very interactive. Uh, they have spent a lot of time with the faculty, the incoming faculty, with pioneering students. Our current chancellor, Giorgio, is the former foreign minister of Singapore. Okay. I think they're very committed to the project. So they okay. do not put pressure on us in a negative sense. Okay. Uh, a lot of them are very leading academics. Uh, they, are, they are there to really mentor the university, uh, to solve problems. So the autonomy of the institution is, 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 is sacrosanct. Yeah, I mean, the board, the board has its uh, areas of function and it pretty much is doing what it, what it needs to do. Okay, so you are on the right direction when you say that you're rebuilding the ancient Nalanda University. Let me tell you, it not only signi it basically signifies that India is present in Asia, not only economically, not only financially, but also intellectually. Thanks to all my guests here, the celebrated faculty members and all the students who've who really, I don't know whether they missed the classrooms or not, but who are here to present and enhance the program. Thanks again from all of you. you. So that's it on this episode from Nalanda University. Goodbye and thanks for watching. <laughs>